Okay. So which of the following best describes fitness in terms of natural selection? Okay. So what does it mean to be fit? Uh, does it mean to be able to escape from predators and not get eaten? Well, that's probably part of it, but is that all of it? I don't know. Let's keep reading and let's see if there's any others that sound better. You obviously don't want to get eaten because if you do, you're not fit, right? Um, being among the strongest in the population. Well, being strong probably helps, but is that what it's all about? Being able to survive, find a mate, and produce offspring. That sounds pretty important too. Being able to survive long enough to reach the adult stage. That also, so all these things sound important. Uh, if you want to be, if you're a species and you want to be successful, you need to be able to do all of these things. But which one of these four just kind of wraps all of them up together in one nice, neat answer? C, correct. Okay. So in this case, all of these things are true individually, but the correct answer to this question is the one that says all of the reasons why you would need, uh, or all of the things that would make you fit. So you do need to survive, find a mate, produce offspring, because if you don't produce offspring, it doesn't matter. You can't pass on your good traits. So it's pointless if you can't pass on your good traits to your kids, because then when you die, your good traits are gone, okay? Um, but all of these other things, A, B, and D, are all part of being able to get old enough to where you can pass on those traits. Okay, so this picture here, do you guys know what this is showing? Do you? Do you remember this? Okay, this is something that we call crossing over, and it's something that we talked about in the past. And I and I put it in a hint here. The picture is showing crossing over that happens during meiosis, where chromosomes, which are just strands of DNA, shuffle their genes together. So remember, when we make um, sperm and egg cells, which we call gametes, before your body puts DNA into a sperm cell to go make the baby, or into an egg to go make the baby. What it does with the DNA is it does this thing called crossing over, where it's basically like shuffling cards. Like before you deal cards, you shuffle them, right? So why? Because you want to mix it up and make it random. Well, your body does the same thing, but the shuffling we call crossing over, and that's what's shown here. So the DNA is being shuffled together and mixed up to make it random. What does that do? What does making it random the DNA random before we put it into a sperm or before we put it into an egg, what does that do? We'll come back to it. If you don't know it, leave it blank. We'll come back to it at the end. Okay. Just for the purposes of the video, I'm going to kind of do that just to kind of make it quicker. Okay. So if you know the answer, put it. If you don't, I promise we'll come back to it when this is done. Okay, <clears throat> the human body is composed of organ systems. Which list present, represents a system organized from least to most complex? <clears throat> Excuse me. So here's my hint, least to most complex, that just means smallest to largest. So which one of these lists goes from smallest thing to a little bit bigger, bigger to the largest thing? So it would probably help to start by finding the answer choice that begins with the smallest thing. So which is smaller of the four things listed as the first choice here? Is the heart, lung tissue, muscle cell, or integumentary system? Which one of those things is the smallest? Yes, it is a muscle cell. Now look at this picture here. So. Remember the levels of organization. Now, this goes from smallest. The smallest thing we've talked about are atoms, right? You put atoms together to make molecules. Molecules together make up cells. So cells are listed here, right? They are, that, there it is, muscle cell. That is the smallest 
thing. So that's the right answer. Okay. Anytime you're looking for smallest to largest or largest to smallest, just look for the thing that starts with the smallest or starts with the largest, whatever it is it's asking for. You just have to remember that a cell is smaller than a tissue, which is smaller than an organ, which is smaller than a system. The cell is smaller than a tissue. You put cells together, it makes up a larger tissue. You put these larger tissues together to make up even larger organs, like the heart. You put those organs together to make up even larger uh, things called a system, like an entire skeletal system. Okay. All right. Which of the com which of the components could be observed using a microscope in a prepared slide of leaf cells, but not in a prepared slide of human cheek cells? In other words, they're asking. What would you see in a plant cell in, um, that you would not see in an animal cell? They give you five things here. In other words, which of these are in plant cells that are not in animal cells? Well, what do plants do that animals don't do? They make their own food using sunlight, right? Okay, do you guys remember where that happens? It happens in this thing called the chloroplasts. Just remember chloro <clears throat> means green. Chlorophyll is green, right? That's what makes plants green, chlorophyll. You guys probably heard that before. Well, they're in a thing called the chloroplast. So chloroplasts are one thing that's in plants. What's something else that plant cells have that animal cells don't have? Correct, it's a cell wall. Animal cells don't have a cell wall. So let's look at this plant cell. So an animal cell looks just like a plant cell except for those two things I just mentioned. This is what you need to remember. Please remember this. The only difference between animal cells and plant cells are two things. The cell wall, which is this tan colored thing that goes around the outside here, and these green chloroplasts, which is what makes plants green. That's why they look green, okay? <clears throat> so animal cells, we aren't green, right? So we don't have these chloroplasts. And we don't have cell walls. If we had cell walls, we wouldn't be able to move around and be flexible. We'd be stiff like a tree. The cell walls are hard and tough, okay? Our cells are not surrounded by a hard structure like this, okay? If they were, we wouldn't be able to be flexible and move and bust down our sweet dance moves. So which one says that three and Four are what plant cells have that animal cells don't. You just tell me that. Okay. Um, yada yada. Niles Eldridge, I'm gonna have to read the whole thing. Sorry, I'm gonna try to read it quick. These two scientists, they researched the lenses of eyes of different species of these things. Don't worry about what they are, it doesn't matter. It says in 1972, they published a paper in which they described the tendency of species to remain the same until a sudden change in the environment causes a new species to appear. That's the key thing, okay? The, what they're trying to say here is that a sudden change caused a new species to appear. What hypothesis was most challenged by this notion? That question tells you the answer. You probably don't believe me, but I'm going to prove it to you, okay? These two guys, these two scientists said that a sudden change could cause a new species to appear. The key word here is sudden. So which of these four hypotheses says the opposite of that? Because it's saying which one is most challenged by the fact that new species can suddenly appear. 
Well, let's look for something that says the opposite of something suddenly appearing. A says that spontaneous generation does not occur. Spontaneous generation means that, um, well, yeah, A, A sounds like it could be it, but let's keep going. Let's read them all. B, embryo development mimics the evolution of species. Does that say anything about speed? How fast you can evolve? Remember, that's what we're talking about. They told you what they wanted you to know. They told you that this was a sudden change. They wanted you to know that whatever is happening is happening suddenly. Okay? So we're looking for an answer that has to do with how fast a species can evolve. That doesn't say anything about how fast something can evolve. What about C? Wallace's hypothesis that geography affects the distribution of species. That says nothing about speed. Darwin's hypothesis that the development of species is a slow, gradual process. Does that mention something about speed? Yes, it does, right? So that's the answer to that one. Darwin's hypothesis said evolution is slow and gradual. This guy said it happened suddenly. Okay, so just you don't have to you don't have to try to be an expert and find out all this stuff. And you know, all you have to do is look for the keywords. Be like, okay, they're telling me this for a reason. Sudden, they want me to know that sudden. Which one is the opposite of sudden? Uh, which part of DNA is responsible for the direct coding of specific traits in an organism? Okay, is it the number of bonds? In DNA, is it the number of carbons in DNA? Is it the sequence of bases in DNA? Or is it the sequence of phosphates in DNA? What's the difference between my DNA and your DNA and the DNA of a plant, the DNA of a frog? It's all the same stuff. It's just in a different what? Sequence, correct. Just remember, it's all about the sequence of DNA. That's the most important part. The sequence of the bases. Not the sequence of phosphates, the sequence of the bases. The GCATs, GCAT, those are the bases. Okay. Um, the body gets the energy it needs to react to an infection by, in other words, where do we get our energy? You guys remember this? You remember what this is? How does our body get energy to power it? The mitochondria, right? So the mitochondria, you know what this, remember what this, uh, this is called, this whole process, it's called cell respiration. This is cell respiration. Oxygen goes in, ATP comes out. I know it doesn't say ATP, there's a question mark there, but that's because that's where ATP should be. So oxygen goes in, ATP or energy comes out. That's cell respiration. So where do we get our energy? It's just asking, where does the body get energy it needs? We'll come back if you don't know that one. But the answer says what I just said. All right, which statement describes why zebrafish experience similar genetic diseases as humans? Okay, so why would zebrafish have similar genetic Genetic means DNA. Why would they have similar DNA diseases to us? If our if we get if us in this other thing get diseases that affect our DNA in the same way, then that probably means that our DNA is similar. If our DNA is similar, that's basically the answer. <laughs> so if our DNA is similar, would we have the same diet? Would it be because we have similar nucleotide sequences? Nucleotides are GCATs, G-C-A-T, right? Would it be because they go through the same embryonic stages? Does that, is that why our DNA is similar? Or is our DNA similar because they produce gametes or blah, blah, blah? It's right here. 
The question is about genetic, genetic diseases. Nucleotides, that's your genetics. That's your DNA. That's your GCATs that make up your DNA, okay? Um, how do the circulatory system and immune system work together to respond to an injury? Uh, what, what system does your circulatory, what does your circulatory system do? Blood, right? And your immune system, what are those? White blood cells, correct. So you're looking for an answer that says something about your blood and your white blood cells. Do you see anything about white blood cells? Yes, see, good. All you have to remember is that, your, is that white blood cells are your immune system, okay? Red blood cells carry blood and oxygen. I'm sorry, they carry oxygen and white blood cells kill bad guys. Okay, you guys might remember this picture. You've had this question before. We have two groups, group one and group two. Uh, just looking at them, what is the main thing that stands out as the difference between the two? Yeah, which one is, there's a, these have a nucleus and these do not. Now they both have DNA, all that squiggly stuff, that's all DNA, but that DNA is not inside of a nucleus. These cells have DNA, but you can't see them because they're tucked away inside the nucleus, okay? So uh, what, is, what is the answer to this one? Correct. One is pro, that's in my hand. Remember, pro means no. Two is uke, uke means nuke. Just remember, pro is no, uke is nuke. Okay, a student studying primary succession should focus on which of these communities? So we have open oak woodland, a grassland, a floodplain, and granite rock. You guys remember what primary succession is? It's this right here. So in primary succession, you start with bare rock, and then small plants start to grow on the rocks and then a little bit larger plants, a little bit larger plants, right? Secondary succession is when new stuff comes in and replaces all of this stuff and then you eventually get to a big giant forest, right? So primary is nothing to something and then secondary is something old to something new. So which one of these, if you want to study how life goes from nothing to something, where would you look? Yeah, you'd look where there was nothing, where you started with nothing. And nothing is granite rock. Okay. Just remember, primary, nothing to something. Secondary, something old to something new. All right, based on this cladogram, which is just a family tree, you guys know how family trees work, right? It shows you how closely related you are to people. It'll show you who your cousins are, who your second cousins are, your third cousins, your great great grandparents. Uh, which statement best describes relationships among millipede orders? So all we have to do is go answer choice by answer choice and see which ones are more closely related than others? So we have, let's start with the first one. And I'm gonna shorten these names just so it's less confusing and scary. So stem, let's just call this one stem. Stem is more closely related to marrow than pen is to marrow. So let's look for stem. There's stem right there. It's, how, how is it related to marrow? Where's marrow? There's marrow, okay. Is it more closely related to marrow than pin up here is to marrow? Is this more closely related to here than this up here is here? Yes, it is. So we can stop there. We've already found the answer. 
We don't have to go any further. Okay, two biomolecules are shown. What are the biomolecules? Remember, carbs, lipids, proteins, nucleic acids. Those are the four biomolecules. We talked about this a long time ago. Uh, how do you know what it is just by looking at it? Well, remember, all biomolecules are made up of chopping, C-H-O-P-N-N. This one just has C, H, and O. This one has C, H, O, and P, but it also has N. It just doesn't show it, which I hate. I don't know why they did that. But look at these letters here, U, A, G, A. What does that tell you? U, A, G, A. You remember these letters? G, C, A, T, and G, C, A, U. Remember G, Cat, and G, Cow? G, Cat makes up DNA. GCAU, GCAL makes up RNA. This is GCAL. These are the letters of GCAL. So, what does this tell you that this is? Molecule Y. Is molecule Y a carbohydrate? Does, does GCAL make up carbohydrates? Does it make up, or does it make up nucleic acids? What is RNA? RNA, RNA, what does the NA stand for? Nucleic acids. So this is RNA. How do you know it's RNA? Because it's got GCAU, GCAL. Here's the letters right here. It's a dead giveaway. So RNA, you know that it's, that's what it is. And that's a nucleic acid. So both C and D say that molecule Y are nucleic acids, but C says molecule X and Y are both nucleic acids. That's not true. So it must be D. Molecule X is a carbohydrate and molecule Y is a nucleic acid. You're not going to know molecular structure. Don't try to think that you have to understand molecular structure. You don't. They tell you the answer you just have to know that when you see G, C, A, and U, those four letters, that that's RNA. That's all you have to remember. Don't try to become a chemistry expert over time, over overnight. Okay. Um, in North American forests, two species of birds, nuthatches and brown creepers, forage on the same trees for insects. Brown creepers feed on insects near the bottom. Nut hatches feed on insects in the top. So these birds are feeding on bugs down at the bottom. These other birds are feeding on bugs that are at the top. Why? Is it to allow the birds to avoid many different types of predators? Are they avoiding predators by being at the top or bottom? Reducing competition between the birds for resources? Well, yeah, they're, I mean, they're not competing with each other, right? So like if I'm eating food that's at the bottom of the tree and you're eating food that's at the top of the tree we're not button heads are we trying to fight over the same thing all right so that's it all right reducing competition okay why does increased respiration in the leaves blah blah blah, blah. already gave up Already gave up on the question. Too bad. I'm just going to guess now and go to the next one. Isn't that what you guys think a lot of times? Let's think about this logically. Okay. So if you go back and read the question, we're going to look for keywords. We're not going to try to be experts. We're just going to look for keywords. Okay. And use logic. Fruits grown in hot climates are usually less sweet than those in cold climates. Hot fruits are not as sweet as cold fruits. Why? Let's find out. The high temperatures increase respiration in plants, reducing the sugar content in fruits. Okay, so do you guys remember what respiration is? Cell respiration, it's when the mitochondria turn sugar into energy. If you're burning more sugar to make energy, 
then you have less sugar because you're burning it. Plants in hot places burn more burn sugar fast. If you burn it, you don't have it. So the more you burn, the less sugar you have, the less sweet you're going to be. So why do the fruits not have as much sugar? Well, it's because they burned the sugar. Why did they burn the sugar? Why do you burn sugar? It's to make energy. So which one of these says that we're burning more sugar to make energy? Correct. It is D. Sugars produced in the leaves are used as an energy source instead of being stored in fruits. All right. What do the two arrows represent? We've got arrow one, which is this big arrow that goes over these, and then arrow two, which goes here. You don't have to know what both of them are. You only have to know what one of them is. If you know that one, you can get the answer. So let's look at arrow two. What are these four little stages here that happen during the cell's life cycle? Do you guys remember what that is? Correct. Arrow two is, and I gave you a hint here, it's PMAT. Remember P-M-A-T? Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, or PMAT for short. This arrow two is showing you mitosis. That's the process where cells split in half because that's how your cells make new cells. Remember, they split in half. They go through these four stages to, to split in half. It's like a four-step process. P is the first step. Step two is M. Step three is A. Step four is T. P-M-A-T. P-M-A-T for short. That's mitosis. There's only one answer choice that says that arrow two is mitosis. Which statement explains how producers are dependent upon consumers for their survival? What are producers? What's a, what's a common word to call producers? Plants, right? Okay, producers are plants. They're dependent on consumers. What are consumers? Animals, right? So in other words, what statement explains how plants are dependent on animals for their survival? Correct. So what do, what do animals give plants that plants need? Right, CO2. Remember, we breathe out CO2, carbon dioxide, and plants breathe it in. Which of these describes the difference between viruses and cells? Okay, so here's my hint. You gotta remember that viruses are not living things. Viruses aren't these little tiny organisms that run around and infect you because they enjoy it. They're just random things. They're like a speck of dust. They're random and they just float around randomly. If you happen to breathe it in, it can make you sick, but it's not like they're out to get you, okay? They just float, they don't make decisions. So what's the difference between a virus and a cell? Keeping in mind that viruses aren't living things and they can't do the things that living things do. Cells contain protein and viruses contain only carbs. That's not true, viruses have a, they're made of, they're pretty much just a protein coat. Remember they're a protein pinata? Viruses are just a pinata. They're a, they're a shell on the outside with stuff in the middle. There's only two parts to a virus and that's it. The shell on the outside is the, pro, the, the part you hit, the pinata part, that's the protein. That's the protein coat. And the candy inside is the DNA. Okay? So viruses do have proteins. So it's not F. G, viruses have flagella, and cells only have cilia, not true. Uh, cells reproduce independently. 
and viruses require a host to reproduce. Those are both true, but let's read D just in case. Viruses have membranes made of proteins and cells have membranes made of nucleic acids. That's not true. Our membrane is our cell membrane, the part that wraps around our cells, is not made up of DNA. So we can rule out J. The only possible answer is H. All right, only two more. As part of the nitrogen cycle, animals acquire some amino acids by doing which of the following? So nitrogen, how do plants get, I'm sorry, how do animals get nitrogen? Yes, well, you gotta know where the nitrogen is, right? Nitrogen is in the plants. That's part of the nitrogen cycle. Remember the nitrogen cycle? Nitrogen goes in the soil, plants soak it up through the roots, and then animals eat the plants. And that's how animals get the nitrogen. And then animals poop and they poop out nitrogen and they pee out nitrogen and it goes back, right? Okay, so animals get their nitrogen by breathing air. No, nitrogen's, nitrogen is in the air, but that's not how they get it into their body. It's not from drinking water or producing waste. It is eating plants. You just have to remember that nitrogen is in the soil and it goes into the plants from the soil. It's not, that's how you get it into your body. You can't just breathe in nitrogen and have it go into your body that way. Okay. You have to, you have to eat it. Which two body systems must directly interact for vertebrate organisms to exchange gases? Here's a hint. When they say gases, they just mean CO2 and O2. So what two systems or what system is responsible for taking in oxygen and putting out CO2? Or in other words, breathing. Do you guys remember what system is responsible for breathing? That's for carrying blood around. Respiratory, but those two do work together. And so the answer is circulatory and respiratory. Respiratory breathes in the gases circulatory takes the gases and delivers them to the cells. So you can breathe in oxygen. It's great that it's in your lungs, but it can't stay there. It's gotta go from there to your toes. Your toes need oxygen, right? Every, every part of your body needs oxygen. How does it get there? Blood, blood carries it there. And that's it. Okay, so which one did y'all not get? Which one of these questions did y'all not get? 